The function of leadership is to create more leaders, not more followers. Welcome to the Paid Forward Society, the podcast where we explore the many facets of leadership as we talk to inspiring managers, entrepreneurs, coaches, veterans, and athletes who empower their teams and deliver results. Together, we discover the, the many facets of uh, leadership and, and the key to success through empathy, purpose, and care. I'm your host, Romain Jourdain. Today, I have the privilege of welcoming Meg Brennan. Meg, welcome to the show. Hi, it's great to be here. Yeah, we did it. We did it, finally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, some back and forth we, we tried to record earlier and uh, I'm glad uh, that finally we are able to uh, to meet and uh, and um and 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 record this discussion. So let me get back to my intro. So you are an accomplished channel leader and I think we will need to explain what channel is, what does it mean? I think so. So you have more than 20 years of experience driving strategy and operations for top technology companies like uh, Riverbed, uh, Dell EMC, First Data, and Quark. Yes, Riverbed again. We met some years ago as we were working together, attending um, an internal MBA called Steel Masters. Um, for me, that was a great experience. Um, I think um, over the course of 18 months, uh, I think, yeah. we were coached by professionals, mentored by senior leadership, and we get to all travel to San Francisco and learn together. I mean, at that time, I was living in San Francisco, so it was not a big trip for me. But still, it was good to to meet all of you. So, uh, and I, I will have more people actually attending the the show soon. So it was a great group That's of cool. people, a great group of people. And yeah. if you ever get an opportunity, if you're listening, and you get an opportunity to go to a leadership development course for your company or anywhere, just do it. Do it. Agree. So Meg, you have a proven record, track record of um, empowering your teams and developing the next generation of leaders. So that's also why I wanted to talk to you. Um, I understand that you believe strongly in uh, in uh, hiring for attitude over skills and make mentorship a priority. Um, of course, beyond your professional accomplishment, you bring a wealth of life experience as well. You are living in Colorado. Um, you embrace the outdoors uh, lifestyle, of course, while also navigating through the remote work environment for over 15 years. So not just uh, a thing with COVID, but yeah. uh, something that uh, you have been practicing for a long time. So perhaps uh, we can uh, discuss uh, about that as well uh, later on in in our discussion and uh, how you you empower teams to uh, to work in, in a very distributed fashion. Yeah. I don't like remote, by the way. Yeah, so remote is not new to me, so um, I think I probably do have some ideas, but maybe others have already, you know, developed the skill as well since we all work remote for so long. Yeah, that's true. So um, you offer a unique perspective on leadership that combines um, strategic thinking, operational excellence, and a passion for developing people. So um, I think uh, that's that's a perfect show to share your experience. So I'm thrilled to dive into your insights on leadership, um, empowering teams, and, and the keys to success in business and life. So please join me in welcoming the inspiring leader, Meg Brennan. Thank you. <laughs> Yay. And by the way, I do have okay. to say right up front, Ron, that the... I love this podcast. I've listened to it. I think that the Pay It Forward Society is such a great thing, and it aligns with what I believe in paying it forward, and I know what you believe. So I, I think it's a, a great idea. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm going to put you on, on the spot. Yep. Since you have listened to other episodes, so you know that my, my first question is to uh, give a chance for um, guests to introduce themselves. Sure. So beyond the... The resume that I've uh, I've uh, summarized. Um, I'm always interested in learning uh, who the people are behind uh, the LinkedIn and uh, and the CV. Yeah. Etiquette. Well, certainly, if you look at my LinkedIn, I am um, I've had a different path than many people in the technology world. Um, very zigzag, not straight. I've done lateral moves. I've done you know all sorts of things like that. That I think, you know, I, I'm always surprised sometimes when I go look at a leader's LinkedIn and and they started at VP. I'm like, how how did that happen? I started at like, you know, sitting in a folding chair answering calls for a software company, you know, and it, it's 
I don't know if everybody else starts there, but you know, I started at the bottom, um, you know, making, I think, I think I was thrilled when I was making $18,000 a year in my first job. You know, we don't talk about money, but you know, as a woman in tech, I believe we should talk about money because it's really yes, important indeed. that transparency of, you know, salaries helps bring people up to more equality. Um, and so anyway, started my career, um, way back when, um, you know, looking, answering calls, doing dealer sales. So that's when you sell through a partner. And funny enough, like I zigzagged everywhere. I did um, enablement. I did sales. I did product management. I have, you know, all in kind of the software world. I did implementation methodologies at uh, JD Edwards, which is now part of Oracle. So I was an expert in JD Edwards One World software. Um, I used to know every little switch and, you know, thing you could choose to implement that software. Um, I then, you know, started in the partner marketing world. So, you know, like many women, I uh, thought was going to stay at home. I stayed home after I had my second child for about six months. Um, and then my aunt actually reached out to me. She had a firm that did partner marketing and she called me and said, I have the perfect job for you. And, um, it was managing a client services team at a small company. We did sales and service for, you know, high tech clients who were doing partner marketing. So marketing through partners to the end customer. And I did that for many years and then, you know, ended up at Dell EMC and then finally at Riverbed where really, I think, you know, my true leadership journey occurred. You know, I went from okay. Not an individual contributor, but really, I'm you know I started as director of operations at Riverbed. I was a manager, really. In my thinking, I was the manager, and um, was given incredible opportunities. I had a female manager, and my executive was a female, and um, they saw value in developing people, um, and they gave me incredible opportunities to develop and grow into a VP in the world and at Riverbed. All right, sounds good. So uh, I think we have a, a very similar path, uh, at least uh, at Ruben. I mean, I, I've always been very on, on the technical side of things, yeah. but uh, but um, I was giving very quickly an opportunity to lead a team to Ruben. Actually, uh, four months in the job oh, wow. when I joined, mm -hmm. uh, so that, that was cool, really cool. From IC to um, to a manager role in four months, uh, that was amazing in a new company, and then uh, yeah, I. I uh, graduated to different levels. I, I think I left before becoming a VP, which I, I think it's still okay <laughs> because uh, I'm, I love what I do now and learning a lot. So uh, so that's really cool. So cool. So yeah, we, we mentioned channel uh, earlier. So it's, it's nothing related to Chanel, the, uh, the brand, right? It's, I uh, wish I could use some swag. Yeah. <laughs> So tell us more about uh, what what the channel is and and why is that important for tech companies? Yeah, I'll tell you. My parents don't know. Like if you ask them what I did, they they would say, "Oh, she does something in marketing." Uh, when I'm actually, you know, historically, I've been in the sales organization most recently, and you know, leading the function of selling through partners. So if you think about just you know, if you're listening and you're not in the tech world, you know, when you go to the grocery store. Right. And you see all those products on the shelves, you know, Doritos or whoever makes Doritos doesn't sell that product directly to your grocery store. It's sold through a channel where it's sold through a partner, likely through a distributor who sells lots of different products. And it's the same sort of thing. I manage that sort of motion um, through to end customers, which in our world are business customers. So we sell technology through sometimes a distributor to a partner who then sells to the end customer who might be like a bank or somebody. Yeah. All right. Maybe my, maybe good. my mom will listen and she'll kind of understand what I do now. <laughs> <laughs> that would be right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have always a hard time, you know, uh, listening to, to how my, even my wife actually <laughs> is describing my job to, to friends and stuff. And I uh, say, so, yeah, she, he's doing technical stuff and uh, he goes to conferences. And, <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That. That's. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. And he's traveling, of course. Yeah. That's what she sees. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. You got to simplify it down. Yeah. Simplify it down. <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, another 
typical question I ask um, my guests is um, if they can share with the, with us their journey into leadership. So uh, describe your first experience in in a, in a leadership role and uh, how you grew into uh, you know becoming a VP. Yeah, I mean, I would say my first experience in leadership, really management, was when I was in my twenties. Um, I had, you know, worked in the sales and customer service, right? Phone lines and faxes. And um, we had a major upgrade happening at Quark. So it was publishing software back in the day. Back in the day. And um, it was, you know, a major upgrade. And our manager left. And they needed a new manager. And so okay. um, I was, you know, lucky enough. First, they promoted somebody else, somebody older and male, um, who struggled in the role and struggled with some other things. And so when he left, then it was a natural next step. And um, I managed about 30 people. Some of them were temps wow. and some of them were full time. So it was a huge step. And I have to say, I was not a very good manager. <laughs> I really like, I thought it was about control. Um, I tried to be nice, at least. I don't think that like most of the people who I worked with would have said I wasn't a very good manager, but I wasn't very thoughtful about helping them develop and helping them grow into, I just didn't like, I was kind of overwhelmed with the role in itself. And, um, you know, but I learned so much uh, working at that company and working in different functions. Um, but I did go from that role into kind of a, you know, a associate product manager. I can't remember what the title was, um, which was not, it was an individual contributor role. So I didn't manage anybody in my next okay. role. And uh, it was, I think, a little bit of a relief, a little bit of a relief. Okay. Um, and then I didn't, you know, I'm, I, then I started managing people again after I had children. So it was probably, I don't know, probably seven or eight years later that I started managing people again. And I'd learned a lot through then. I'd been a, you know, an instructional designer and a trainer. And so I'd had to manage class because it was back when, you know, you did a lot of training in person. So I'd have managed classrooms and, you know, things like that. I, I think teachers are probably the best managers. So I think we should all be hiring yeah. former educators because I, you know, they can probably manage like nobody's business. Um, yeah, probably. Yeah. But yeah, so, you know, then I became a, a, a manager of more professional, you know, professional level people and, um, you know, but I never, I'm never hesitant to be in an individual contributor role either. I like getting the job done. Um, you know, yeah. I do. I love leading, but I think you can lead from any position. I don't think that you have to um, have a title you know, manager, director, or VP, you don't have to have that to be a leader. You can lead from anywhere in an organization. And um, I was really lucky at um, Riverbed where we worked together that, you know, I came in as, as a director. I'd gone from it. I was an individual contributor at Dell EMC um, in their partner marketing operations team, but I was responsible for lots of money. Um, and I moved into a, you know, director level position with a whole team under me, um, a whole team at the time, which was like three or four people, I think. And, um, but it was, you know, a director level position. And then I was able to like start to do some, I, you know, after I'd been there for a little bit, proven myself as a capable person, um, you know, I was able to get an executive coach and I, you know, had great managers who saw something in me and I, that, um, you know, they thought that that would be helpful and it was. Um, so huge shout out to them and to my executive, my first executive coach, uh, Greg Giuliano, who, you know, um, just helped me turn a corner from being a manager to really being a leader. He, um, you know, we just asked questions about, you know, it was sort of like having Dr. Phil, he'd be like, well, how's that working for you? Um, yeah. And it just changed how I thought about things, how I thought about interacting with people. You know, my team was very small and we would get lots of asks from other teams and it was overwhelming, you know, and it, I would be tempted to be really defensive when people came to me and somehow working with Greg and getting his advice um, helped me realize that like that wasn't working well for me. And if I could, pause and start to ask questions about the priority and think bigger about the company and 
what would be more important and how could I prioritize the things that were more important, you know, it really changed the way that I led um, and the way that I worked okay. cross functionally and things like that. So, um, yeah, that's interesting. Can, can we pause on that? Yeah, uh, and we have a, a, a bit. Uh, it it sounds like the main advice that you were given is that, um, or oh, you were very much in execution mode. Uh, yes, as you describe, you know, really in the transaction uh, with uh, with others, with other teams, and uh, and with your your individuals, and um, what uh, Greg. Uh, in, inspire you inspire you to to do is to think big so that's a that's a big one uh, it's uh, yeah. basically look around the corner look at, like around the, the big picture and see okay so what's your role into this big picture and how can you contribute back to the business is that yeah i mean there was that there was um i mean one of the things i remember distinctly you know learning from him was you know you need to you can step into the gap Right. When there's a gap in leadership, you get on a call, there's a bunch of people, everybody knows there's a problem. You can step into that gap and be a leader without taking on all the work. And that was completely new to me. So I could step in and say, OK, are we all in agreement that this is the problem? Are we all in agreement that, you know, maybe we have option A or option B? Um, OK, who should take those? And so I didn't have to take all the work like I was so used to you know, being in the weeds and like, I, I'm a hard worker. And, you know, I just thought that that's the way you got promoted was being a hard worker. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, not being the one who stepped back and asked questions and, you know, helped define the next step. And so, you know, there were some skills and it was, I probably only worked with him. Maybe I worked with him a year and, um, You know, that coaching was great. So, you know, like I said, if you go to leadership, you know, if you get a chance to go to leadership training, if you get a chance to have a coach, I would almost suggest, like, it would be worth hiring one yourself sometimes. Okay. Or the investment. Yeah. I experienced that uh, recently, actually. I had a coach. Yeah. Uh, Karen, if you remember, uh, Karen Gerstein. Gerstein. She, uh, she was... Um, at Riverbed with us, but but she she grew into a um, a, a a coach and uh, and uh, yeah I, we worked together for a few months and that was very helpful for me. Yeah, it's amazing. Like just having and they don't know your business at all, and um, but they're able to ask tough questions and you know they don't you know you're paying them or somebody's paying them, but they're always they're yeah. not always nice, right? They're you know like. Is that the way you want it no, to be? They, like they'll ask you tough questions. It was a little bit like a little bit of therapy, you know. But <laughs> yeah, but not personal. Yeah, it's all about the work, right? All about the work. But about you know, for for me, how are you? How can you balance? You know, I had two kids at home, and you know, my husband's great, but you know, doesn't always pick up his socks. Um, so how can you balance? You know, how can you balance all of it? I'm sure you pick up your socks. Yeah, on. I'm sure you do. I do. <laughs> I I really do. There are many things I don't do, but this I do. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you can ask my wife actually. But yeah, yeah, I do that. <laughs> The uh, okay, that, that's that's super good. I, I think um, what I've learned through, through this experience also um, being coach is that. Um, um, I, I realized that before, but uh, but I think uh, I, it was clear to me once I have a, a, a coach is that um, being a leader is a very lonely job. Yeah, it is. And uh, and uh, and I didn't realize that fully until uh, I I have the opportunity to talk to speak freely with someone else. Because um, I mean, uh, are you going to talk about all your problems to your manager? Uh, mm -hmm. No, because you feel that it's uh, probably not the right thing to, uh, to do um are you going to do that with your peers uh it's difficult sometimes yeah so uh, so you, you end up with um a lot of things to to think about uh, of course you can talk to your partner but it's uh always a bit difficult because they are not in the job so they don't know the details and uh, so um so i felt i felt it was good to to have those moments with the coach and uh and um 
have this moment of uh, self reflection and uh, and um, and also someone holding the mirror and say, "Yep, you screwed," or, or <laughs> "Yep, you could do better there," or 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 getting some advices, but um, without being judged in any way, yeah. or because uh, there's no performance management around it. It's, uh, yeah. So I think it's a um, it's a free space. Yeah, and you're so right about like leadership is lonely. It's lonely. Like you don't have, there's a certain, when you're a manager, there's other managers and somehow you're close enough that you have a a club. When you move up kind of director level, maybe um, there's not, people don't always understand your work. And so, or your problems that you're having at work. You know, if you can find people though, that can be that, you know, colleague who, um, you know, just helps you like, you know, be, you know, check yourself. And if it's an executive coach or, you know, in my last role at Riverbed, um, I had a peer who we scheduled uh, like a Wednesday morning, Wednesday morning, my time he's in the UK. So afternoon, his time call where it was just like, you know, like, let's just hang out. Like, cause we don't work together. Yeah. You know, and that's part of the problem about being remote as well. So being remote is lonely, being a leader is lonely. And so, you know, how can you, kind of get out of that a little bit. Um, and it's hard because we all work so many hours and it's really hard. But I, I tell you, those 30 minutes meant the world to me. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I, I'm doing the same actually with um, other leaders um, across the company. Um, so we are not working together. We have no strings attached, right? <laughs> uh, so uh, so it's easy. I mean, and it's easier to have to have those conversations, and um, and actually we have um, we have we have a um, a book club on Fridays where we are exchanging about. Uh, so we are trying to read a book, and uh, and uh, and that's a great way to connect. And it's so usually about leadership, so it's a good good uh, topic as well, and a and good way to um, to exchange about issues and challenges that we are facing. Yeah. Okay. I'd love to hear about any like good leadership books that oh yeah yeah definitely we can we can definitely share a a good list there so going back to your journey sorry we digressed so uh so you were um in this uh, new role at riverbed and and you get you you got uh greg as your coach so that helped you to think bigger so what's next so yeah help me to think bigger i took on you know additional responsibilities and then uh, my manager, Cindy Herndon, uh, left the company. She had a great new opportunity. Um, and so she left the company and there was a gap. And thankfully, I had really been in contact with kind of her manager saying, what, you know, how can I grow? What can I do? Like, and, you know, she gave me really direct, you know, I was be a little wishy-washy, you know, should I go this direction or this direction? And um, this is Bridget Biznet, who's a former uh, leader from Cisco. Yeah. And, you know, she said, Maggie, just, you need to decide what you want to do and, you know, decide what it's going to take to get there. She was, you know, really, she's, she's a very direct person, but kind and nice. And, and um, so I had been talking with her. So making sure I had that kind of skip level um, and I had Cindy's sponsorship as well. So, you know, moving up to the next level, um, you know, was something that was possible. And Bridget left soon after that. So that was, you know, a little crazy as well, you know, moving into a position. And then um, then I reported to somebody who hadn't done channels before. Luckily, he was the nicest guy um, and smart, and a, you know, a good, a good person to report to. But um you know, to have somebody to have your manager really doesn't understand your, you know, what you do um, was a big challenge. Yeah. But um, you know, thankfully, a good a good person, right? Who is a good listener, so he he learned quickly, and um, so yeah, I you know was able to move into kind of the VP of Global Channels at Riverbed, and um, you know did that role for you know a couple of years, and then. Yeah. Just last May, I uh, got laid off. So, <laughs> yeah, that's super unfortunate. So, so let's let's discuss about this uh, a little bit better uh, later on okay. during the show. Uh, um, and and thank you for for sharing this. Uh, I know it's not always easy. No. The um, 
you brought up a very interesting point and I wanted to to discuss about it. You said that your manager didn't really understand what you were doing. Yeah. So what have you learned from this experience? So I, I think one thing that I learned was that kind of the way you lead ma really matters. Like the way that he led was, you know, I mean, he could be very tough with people. I heard him be very tough with people if they weren't being clear or they were, you know, but if you were really doing your best and, you know, being a clear communicator, he had your back. He had your back and he was open to learning and open to come, you know, he didn't make decisions in a silo. He would, you know, really, um, you know, give me the authority to make decisions. And, you know, I'd run, certainly run things by him, but, um, you know, just leading out of that kind of kindness and listening and, you know, it was just something I learned from him about how to be a good leader. And he's in another role now and doing very well, I'm sure. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm lucky that I had that experience uh, because I had so many good managers in a row showing me good leadership qualities, Yeah, which was a gift, a real gift. So do you remember some of the impactful questions you would ask to, uh, because of course he, he was not, um, uh, he didn't have uh, your experience and uh, and your insight yeah. into the business. So, how would he uh, learn? How would he? I, I can't tell you how many to... times he asked me why. Why do we do it that way? Why is it set up like that? Why? And and he wasn't afraid of looking dumb. And so I did learn that from him as well. I mean, I think I kind of knew that before, but um, it, he just really reflected that that he would just ask why. So he was seeking to understand and he wasn't, he was humble. He wasn't afraid of looking, um, looking bad. So he didn't have to seem like a know-it-all. He never, you know, he just asked, you know, okay, why, what, what do you think we should do next? Um, and uh, yeah, it was really, you know, and it helped me process things. So I'd say, yeah, why do we do that? Like we've always done it that way, right? Why do we do it that way? And um, we, so then we could change some things because we realized that there wasn't a good, you know, good reason behind the why. Yeah, true. That's true. I, I was asking a question because um, um, I feel that um, some people in my team are sometimes struggling. And, and I think the a good way to manage up with someone who has no clear understanding of what you do is um, with powerful storytelling. So um, I feel that um, if you come with a laundry list of all the activ all the activities that you are doing, uh, I've done this, I've done that, and I've uh, uh, got those numbers here and there, it's difficult to grasp. I mean, so what? I mean, I, I think the question is so oh, what? So um, that's the more passive aggressive way, right? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. That's uh, okay. Okay. I mean, yeah. It's sort of the same thing. So, it is sort of the same thing. Um, you know, it's why. So what? Like, what does this do yeah. for us? Or why did we do this? And what was our? What did we hope to achieve? Um, you know. So yeah. So what? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So and and um and hopefully my team uh, understand that i have uh, I, I i'm i'm kind <laughs> i don't mean to be uh, aggressive at all it's uh, it's just a matter of um, making sure that um we take the time to reflect because um, i think it's um super common to 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 be in the flow and say okay i'm going to deliver this and that and this oh. and that because it feels good um and there's this sense of achievement which is also good but um, at, at the end of the day um i i want my people to be able to reflect on um the progress I, i'm all about momentum yeah that's what i'm trying to say yeah okay so um the metrics are what they are they are um you know, you, you, it, those are guesses. You say, okay, I want to achieve this goal by the end of the year 
for whatever reasons, because we believe, uh, uh, because we did uh, last year 20% uh, less, so we believe that we need to do uh, more next year and, and so on. Uh, but those are aspirational. aspirational. Um, but I think what I liked the most is is uh, showing that we have progress, that there is momentum, that uh, as a company we are, you know, growing. Um, so um, so that's why I think it's important that um, that people are not optimizing for the metrics, but more um, what is the big story and and the why? What, what's the what do they want to achieve and and how? I think it's uh, yeah, it's, important. I, it's interesting because I am the very data driven person. And so, and I think that leaders can kind of fall in different categories. Um, I'm very data driven, and that's the way I know that I'm making progress is by, um, you know, not just telling the stories. Which I agree, the stories are so like you have to be able to tell a story because that's what inspires people. Um, but I think without the data, sometimes I worry that it's a little fluff, right? And so I need the data to say, hey here's the story and then here's the data that supports my story exactly so so that's so, that's perfect i i feel that i'm also very data driven but sometimes i mean uh, people are leading with data and not telling the story i mean for example i did um, a presentation to 1000 people is that a good thing or is that yeah. uh, or or i mean i mean what's the context yeah. why why do we believe it's great why do we believe uh, um, so um compared to other meetings compared to other conferences for example um you know um help me understand what the number means and uh, and i think that's that's part of the story so having the data is crucial but you need to put that into context and and explain in the bigger picture how does it accrue to the bigger goal or big rocks that you have yeah, defined. I have had to very painfully learn that story. So if any like executives that I've had in you know previous roles, I apologize for giving you like the fifty point PowerPoint slide with the nine point font. I am guilty, guilty, guilty. I just had to learn, right? I think you're right. You lead with the story and the data is there for back. Um, That's correct. You lead for, with the story. You lead with the inspiration. You lead. Um, one of my old colleagues said, you know, you have to be brief, be bright, be gone. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's the that's the most difficult. It took me a long time to. I'm still learning that lesson because I have to start when I'm like preparing an executive presentation. I start with so much detail, so, yeah. and then I have to pare it down. I have to pare it down. I have to pare it down, and but it helps me like to. Un, I have to understand the detail to get the big picture. Not other people are much better at understanding the big picture without having to know the detail. I have to know the detail. So, um, and I know that about myself um, and I'm, I'm always a skeptic. So if somebody doesn't have the detail, you know, I'm like, oh, I don't know, that might not be real, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know whether you know Mark Seeger. He was um, a VP uh, at uh, Riverbed. Uh, I interviewed him in, I think, episode four. He was the um, VP of uh, SEs in, uh, in EMEA. Oh, I don't know that I ever talked to him. Okay, because uh, he, like data. Uh, he, like the, <laughs> he was yeah, he's very much into the data. He's very much into um, into uh, you know having the details and and actually um, um, when he and I we we discussed um, on 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 that episode, uh, we um, he shared that um, he was asking question to salespeople and and his his reports on the okay. Give me more details. It, it, it was not, you know, trying to poke around to to find uh, the little thing that would not work. It was really, I mean, generally trying to understand anyone. He, he needed the data, yeah, uh, and the details to get, you know, to that level of understanding and say, okay, yeah, we we could. Uh, I feel confident we can move. Yeah, forward. people can just send it. So, uh, like, I just do better if they send it to me in advance and I can look at it. Then I can ask questions. Um, yeah. Yeah, but it's yeah, they, there's there's a leadership principle at Amazon which is called deep dive, uh, which is basically we expect from leaders to be able to drill down and 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 I, I'm amazed. I mean, uh, some of our senior leadership, 
So when we have meetings with um, our SVPs or yeah, you you tell them something, you you present a doc, and super quickly they can drill down to the to the tiny tiniest detail. With that data, I say, oh, that doesn't make sense. What's going on here? I say, how, how, how can you do that so quickly? So, so that's amazing. I, I feel that's a. Uh, so I think this is, I is we're going to talk about it. I know, but I think this is a quality of introverts. And Jeff Bezos is an introvert. I have heard. Yeah, most likely. Yeah. So yeah, it's a good segue into the next topic: uh, being a leader and introvert. And and we, so when we prepared for the for the for this discussion, you told me that you were introvert. I said, that's, I mean, Meg being introvert. I mean, it's not <laughs> it's not what I thought about you, to be honest, because uh, <laughs> I've always seen you. Super we're outgoing and uh, you know talking to many people and uh, I remember our um, you know steel masters uh, so this um, internal MBA that we had uh, where we met actually uh, I felt that you were you know super um, engaged and talking to everybody and uh, so uh, so tell me more about being an introvert. So I think it's about energy and what you know where you get energy and where energy, where things drain you, right? And most people probably heard this, right? But if I go to a conference or I go to, you know, a training um, where it is, I love it. I'm engaged. I'm excited. I like to be around people. And then I cannot wait to go home, get back to my hotel room. Like everybody's like, Oh, let's go out. Let's go have more of this. I'm like, Oh no, the battery level, you know, I'm at zero. I have to, I'm in the red zone. I have to, you know, go close. Um, and, you know, then I'm, you know, I have to, and after a week of something, like a week at a conference, I'm so happy to have a week, you know, away from things. A week heads down, focused on things, or with smaller groups of people I know, because that doesn't drain, doesn't drain me. But, you know, the big, lots of people things, I love, love, love them. But it is very draining to me. Um, and yeah. my husband is exactly the opposite. He is the most ex extroverted person you could ever meet. Um, if he hears me saying this, I'll probably try and sneak in and get on camera. Um, but I've learned from him, right, how to be an extrovert. And I've always liked people. So that's, you know, but yeah, I would say by nature, I'm, you know, I, I like to, you know, kind of have that fun time with people and then come home decompress or have a, you know, a few days where I'm looking at data, where I'm kind of, you know, working with just my team. Like, you know, I can't, I couldn't be somebody who was out in big groups of new people all the time. I can do it 50%, but I can't do it 100%. All right. So we wanted to talk about that topic of being introvert and a leader and, um, it's not a problem, right? Or, or is that because of people seeing or expecting leaders to be um, super, um, uh, let's say, uh, visionary and uh, and um, outgoing and uh, yeah. and uh, you know with a lot of uh, charisma? Is that is that what? I think that that's part of it, and I think there's part of it too that uh, many many leaders are. Um, they sit in that very charismatic, visionary, you know, leading uh, without knowing. You know, like, let me give you an example. My husband, the extrovert, will, we will go on vacation, right? We're going to someplace, neither of us knows, right? And he will so confidently say, we need to go this way and start walking that sometimes I'll just follow him. Right. And I'll go, no, I don't, I don't think we're going the right way. You know, I, I have the map up here and we're going the wrong way. But he's so confident directionally that I sometimes follow him. Right. And so I think that, there, okay. you know, and I don't know if that's a extrovert thing, but it's something I relate to extroverts that they have this innate okay. confidence that sometimes I'm like, well, let's look at it. Like until I looked at the data, I don't, often have the confidence until I've analyzed a bit. I don't have the confidence. So, you know, going into a meeting, I love to get the pre-information on the meeting so that I can look at it 
think about it. And then I come in with really good questions and good decisions. And But I'm less good about making like without information decisions where, okay. you know, there are a lot of leaders who will make decisions and sometimes not good ones, right? Because that's just their personality type. They're, okay. you know, they're the fast deciders. And sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. So I have to work a little bit more on making faster, less analytical decisions. And they have to work a little bit more on making a little bit more thoughtful decisions with a little bit more data. Yeah. You're somewhere in the middle. Yeah, I, okay. Yeah, I see what you mean. So um, so basically, there are a group of people who are more um, gamblers, as in, okay, yeah, it feels good. Let's go. Let's go. Okay. Let's do it. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and on the other side of the spectrum, um, those who are um, really into the data, analyzing it and uh, making sure that we are doing the right thing. But, uh, but, uh, but yeah, I agree with you. Uh, we need to strike the right balance between um, the bias for action and, uh, and, uh, and the dive. And the you need the bias for action, right? As a good leader, I think you do need that. Um, but informed action, you know? Yeah. Uh, I, and I think it's surprising. I think that, you know, if you looked at, you know, we've all worked for the shiny object chaser, right? Where like every, might be 30 days, might be 90 days, you're chasing after a new shiny object. Those are the people who aren't maybe making the most thoughtful decisions, right? So if those people could just take two seconds and do a, ask, ask their more introverted or more analytical people for a little bit more information, you know, to reinforce decision making, I think that you'd have more companies. I mean, you know, Amazon is an incredibly successful company led by who I think is, you know, is an introvert. Microsoft, Bill Gates says he's an introvert, right? Another hugely successful company. Um, so, you know, there are extroverts leading companies that are introverts. Um, often the extroverts get a lot of the attention. Yeah, that's true. That's true. The, uh, yeah. Okay. I see what you mean. So, um, what would be a good uh, countermeasure for our friends who are extroverts? Well, I think you know, one thing, they have incredible skills, right? We don't want, we want their like inspiration. They get people to follow so much faster and easier, right? I could need to learn from them. Um, I think they just need to listen. So I think that's the biggest thing. And, and not just listen to the other people who are like them. So to listen to the people who are like, hmm, I looked at the data and it says this, or did you think about this, right? If, if they listen, like really thoughtfully listen, you know, and have maybe a few few people that are in their sounding board that um, aren't the people who are the same as them, I, I think that they're just so much better leaders. And that's the way to, across the board, right? Better leaders listen to a variety of people. They have a variety of people yes. on their staff, um, you know, it's not, you know, it's diversity of thought, right? Clearly, yeah, yeah. I I definitely favor that more and more. I realize um, how powerful it is to um, to get the feedback and uh, or or poke around and and uh, and ask for different perspective. Uh, I think um, what what I'm trying to, to coach my team on is uh, or or some individuals that are not necessarily my directs is. Um, is to detach detach ourselves from our ideas or projects, and uh, and suddenly when you do that, it's easier to get the critiques and the feedback about your ideas. And you are generally asking, okay, is that are we going in the right direction? Are we missing missing anything? Are we? Uh, and and I feel that uh, uh, yeah, it helps a lot. It, That's it helps so hard to, to do. Uh, it's so true, but it's yes. so hard to do. Like you're like. Hey, are you going to call my baby ugly? You know? I, okay, you can. Okay. You know? But be nice yes. about it. Yeah, I know. And that, by the way, that's the biggest but, gift when somebody gives you constructive input, you know, that, you know, says, hey, that might not be the right direction or that might not look as good as you thought it looked. You know, boy, saves you from wasting time it's such a gift and it makes you better it makes you know them better yeah and and what one of the 
the way we are, um, I think, uh, making progress as a team on that topic is, um, is um, so at Amazon, we have a very strong writing culture. Mm-hmm. So uh, we don't do PowerPoints, yeah, we do, you know, yeah. narratives and, uh, and we have different formats and a good first format is a one pager where, where you are saying, okay, I have this idea. This is, I think, um, the, the general direction. Um, and you try to get feedback, early feedback. Yeah, smart. So you are not so do- you are not so deep into uh, your thinking and your ideas, and and so and and you are more open at that time about uh, getting feedback. Yeah. And that's super helpful because that helps you to redirect your thinking and say, "Oh yeah, I didn't think about it," and and then uh, because you are more detached from it because it's early, say, "Okay, yeah, yeah, I, I welcome feedback," and then and then it becomes an habit. Actually, because if you start small, uh, you have not invested hours and days in the uh, on it. But um, it, it's you know it was uh, probably a one hour thing, so uh, so it's okay. Yeah. And, and then it helps you to detach yourself, and and then you say, okay, I'm going to seek for more feedback and more feedback and more feedback, and uh, and that's uh, that's good. Yeah. And then sometimes you need to 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 stop getting asking for feedback and get, get and just go. Down. Yeah, I agree because I have been in the endless feedback loops. Of, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know what a, an analysis paralysis, right? You, you can't do it. That, that is the, you know, leaning towards decision of the, what did you say? The, the bias, bias fraction. fraction, bias fraction, right? That you have to start moving. Like you just have to. Yes. Just you can't overanalyze things. And good enough. You can be good enough. Like you don't have to be perfect. Yeah. So a lot of perfectionists out there in the world, and uh, you don't have to be perfect. If you're good enough and move forward in business, you move fast. That's, that's, that's important. Right. Yeah. There's actually a book that I'm looking forward to, um, to read, to reading. is uh, So um, those are – it's a couple of women. They They are – wives and uh and uh and they have a podcast on the uh, on hbr i can't remember the name uh right now but i i will i would put that in the in in the notes yes, and uh and they announced that they they are going they are writing a book they are going to release it in october i think and it's about uh you know um making decision faster in business oh so, i need so really looking i need to read that because well, yeah. i'm analytical and i can get into analysis paralysis so um yeah, it can drive. Yeah, it can drive also crazy. I don't want to be that person. I don't want. I want to. I'm going to read that book. Yeah, I'm okay, so book. I, you I know, we all have things to work on, right? We all have things to work on. Um, as we were talking about introverts, um, just for anybody listening, there's a book and a TED talk um, from Susan Cain called "The Power of Introverts," and I highly encourage yeah. anybody who's not an introvert to watch or read the book. I, I watched it. Yeah, I watched it's it. Good. It's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so um, are we good with this topic? Uh, I think so. I think so. Yeah, yeah, that's good. So mo- let's move on to another topic, which is uh, also uh, close to your heart. I know, dear to your heart, it's uh, being a woman in tech. So uh, yeah, let's talk about it. Well, so number one, I love tech. I have I spent a very tiny, like eighteen months outside of the tech world, and I could not wait to get back. So I love being in tech. I think the smartest people in the world are in tech. So um, I think the innovation is incredible. But women are less than a third of tech company employees. And that's a hard place to be. I mean, imagine that, you know, you go to meetings and you're surrounded constantly by people who think just a little differently than you. Because women do think, yeah. women prioritize differently, women collaborate differently, um, and not all women and not all men, right? There's variety, but um, it is. It's kind of we were talking about. It, it's lonely in leadership. It's lonely to be a woman in tech, and as you move up the stack, it's lonelier and lonelier. I can't imagine what it feels like to be a female CEO. You know, yeah, like that's got to be lonely, or a female head of product, even lonelier, right? Female head of engineering, like that's lonely. Female CIOs, that's lonely. And so, you know, I I think that, you know, that that's hard. And women, you know, are leaving tech. Women, you know, 
when I graduated from college in the early 90s, women were like 50% of computer science graduates. And now, wow, like less than 20%, I think. It's a small number. And so, yeah. you know, in any hard science, I um, was recently, I'm a CU, University of Colorado um, graduate, so SCO buffs. Um, you know, I'm in, you know, Coach Prime is like, I'm following him religiously. Um, but I was, I went to the game against CSU and we had a tailgate and my son's a student up there and he's in astrophysics. So his friends are all in astrophysics. And I was talking to a couple of his friends who are female and they said, yeah, it's lonely. Sometimes I go to a class and I'm the only woman in that class. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I'm not surprised. I graduated some years ago <laughs> and, uh, and I remember um, there were five women in uh, in in the promo, five out of sixty. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it was not a big number. And uh, one of them is still a very good friend of mine, and she's still into tech, and uh, she's a leader, and I love her. She's she's great. Um, but uh, but I I know that some of them dropped also. Yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah. I, it's a, it's it's, a difficult. To, so so what what can we do? What can we do? What's the, what's the path for what, what's the path forward? I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to do with this show is also um, to uh, to give a voice uh, to some models um, because um, I think uh, it's always good to have model to look to. Uh, and, uh, but but what can we do? So. I would say a few things. So often we try and put this all on the women to solve the problem. And I really like women are being asked to change. Like, like I can't tell you how many women I know have been told like, Hey, you need to work on your executive presence. And men never get told that net hardly ever. There may be occasionally, but it's always women who get told that women get identified as the junior person in meetings. Right. So if I go to a meeting as an executive, I will tell you, like, I have had people ask me where the lunch is. Like, oh, are, are we having lunch brought in? You know? Okay. Did you take care yeah. of that? So I think that it's on all of us to say, hey, you know, where are women carrying extra load? Can I carry some of that load? Um, so women carry almost all of the load. I would say three out of four people in DEI initiatives at companies are women. So if men could help carry the load there to really help to, you know, across the board DEI, right? Um, help to help with that, to, you know, create the message. We all have um, subconscious bias, right? We all, I have it. I know I have, right? And if you can just try and, you know, you, me, everybody, check ourselves, right? I might default to thinking that, you know, the white guy at the front of the room is the leader. Well, guess what? He might be the project coordinator who ordered lunch, right? Yeah. <laughs> so before you say something, ask. Check yourself, right? Before you ask for somebody to take notes, think about are you, you know, sharing the wealth of that and thinking about who's, you know, proactively doing things, planning the team parties and, you know, all the fun activities that makes it fun to go to work. Who's doing all that? <clears throat> try and try and make sure it's shared. Um, and I would say when we're looking at who we promote, and this is the subconscious bias as, as well, especially at the early levels, um, you know, the research McKinsey did, you know, does a state of women in business report. And what they're finding is that it's the first step, right? It's the first step promotion to manager where a hundred men are promoted, only 87 women are promoted. And so, and it's not because, you know, there's something, you know, that the people doing the promoting aren't inherently, you know, sexist or, you know, misogynist or anything like that. It's because they have this yeah. bias that we all, you know, that we all have, you know, you always hear those jokes about, you know, the doctor and blah, blah, blah. Right. And, and the twist of the joke is, is that the doctor's a woman and nobody gets it. Right. Um, it's, you know, so if we can check our bias, I think that, and carry the load, um, 
I think that that's good. I think it's also really important for men in leadership to mentor women, people of color, in addition to, um, you know, people that look like them. Mentor, promote, try to develop proactively because you won't realize that subconsciously you may be doing the opposite. Mm -hmm. So you got to kind of proactively counteract it. It may feel uncomfortable. It won't feel uncomfortable for it. So I think that those are some some things. I mean, I was told directly um, by a, another leader, male leader, that, you know, it was during the whole Me Too thing, so several years ago, um, that because of that, he didn't feel comfortable mentoring women. How disappointing. And, so you know, three out of four men, in our, the three out of four people in our organization are of leaders are men, and they don't want to mentor women. There's only the one out of the four that's mentoring women. So... And what do you think is the reason for this? Because they, I mean, you said it. There's it, fear. It, I think there was just, possible. you know, there's fear that they would say the wrong thing. I don't, I think it's genuine. Um, you know, they'd make a joke and it would, you know, not come off right. Or I don't, you know, I, I think that it's, I think it's sincere. I don't think that it's, um, you know, I think there's just fear. It's like, okay, well, how do I get around that fear? You know, okay. how do I? How do I face the uncomfortable? We all have to face the uncomfortable. And the more you do it, I think the more comfortable you get. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think we're, I understand what you mean. There, there was a, I had a discussion with um, from, from colleagues. Uh, they, not colleagues, sorry. They some some friends who are working in tech as well, who have a position of powers like CEOs. And um, and they told me that um, they didn't feel comfortable having one on ones in a room with women. Yeah. Um, for because uh, they f they have this fear that uh, it could be misinterpreted or it could be you know um, a you know an opportunity for lawsuits or yeah. uh, over um, over you know and uh, and and. Uh, and, but they're not bad people. They're just fearful. They're just afraid, right? So how can they? Because if even half of them do that, it's the imagine like how that multiplies down to and you know it just multiplies. And then women stay in the same. You know what they say now. It's like it'll be a, at the rate of change that we have now. It'll be like 132 years before we have equity. 132 wow. years. I don't have 132 years. I, my <laughs> daughter doesn't, you know? Um, yeah. So yeah. How do we, like, I think it's, I think it's just like when somebody says that, I think it's okay to then ask the question, well, how are you going to make sure that the women on your team are treated equally? How are you going to make sure yeah. that they have the same opportunity? I think that's just asking. It's sincerely asking. It's not, um, you know, it's not criticizing. It's not, you know, people have sincere worries. And I, I think we have to, you know, we have to believe in people. I, you know, I believe in people. Yeah. I built a, almost every man I've ever worked with is a good, good guy. And, you know, very few really like bad ones. And so if we can get all the good guys doing the right thing, we get all the good women doing the right thing, you know, diversity will just happen. Yeah. yeah, true. That's a very good point. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm an optimist. I really do think that. I think that this is something that could be, like, I think it could happen. I think we just have to think about, you know, not putting people on the defensive, but asking the yes. questions. Like, what do you think you could do? Have you thought about trying this? Have you, you know. I understand you have a fear. Where does that come from? Mm -hmm. You know, because I have fears too. Yeah, right. You know, I don't like to walk around at night, even in my very safe neighborhood. Right. And, you know, because I have fears. Are they reasonable? Maybe, maybe not. Right. So maybe I need to, you know, maybe it's, you know, two o'clock in the morning isn't a great time for me, but I'm probably fine at eight o'clock at night. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I think it, it reminds me of a discussion I had with um, Daryl. I keep going back to Daryl because uh, 
it was one of the the guests I had um, in the first season that uh, really uh, I was just, that was a shock. It was uh, I, that's uh, some, some one of the best discussion I had. And uh, I have to listen to that was, one. Uh, I have to listen to that one. Yeah, I've, he he's my guru now. <laughs> you know, I, I've I've listened I've listened to this episode uh, several times myself, because uh, because all the time I say, wow, that that's super good, that's super powerful, and uh, and I keep uh, listening to me saying, oh yeah, that, I didn't think about it. <laughs> and, uh, so that was quite a you know um, an amazing episode for me at least. And um, and what he keeps saying is that uh, you need to be in- intentional. It's all about being intentional, being, uh, you know, you need to be intentional about what you want to, to, um, to do and how things will, uh, will come up. It's not, I mean, um, good intentions are not enough. You, you really need to be actions. To, yeah. To actions and, uh, say, okay, so you want more diversity in your team. So be intentional about it. What, what are you going to do about it? It's not uh, you. You don't rely on HR to recruit, uh, you know, more women on your behalf. You have to be intentional to do that, and uh, and you want to have to, in the way you drive uh, your business, your meetings, your business reviews. Uh, you need to be intentional also on giving the voice to. Uh, the underrepresented communities to women, um, so they can give their ideas. They can they can uh, you know help you become better also. So um, yeah. Yeah, it was it's a it's a great great. Um, I love uh, that. Just be a, yeah, yeah, just be intentional. <laughs> like uh, that is fantastic advice. And I, I said in, at the beginning of the year, intentional was my year for twenty twenty three. So okay. Uh, yeah, it is, and I think I, I put it on the list also for 2024. <laughs> I got to work on 2024. I don't know yet. <laughs> I always try to come up with something yeah. like that, though. Something that's going to be like kind of my theme for the year. Yeah. Another theme that I have um, is to be more still related to to in, being intentional is to um, to be um, very focused. Um, and uh, I feel that uh, when I do that, I, I mean, uh, it's night and day. It's, uh, it's hard. And, uh, and really focusing on the big rocks, on the big things that are uh, saying, okay, yeah, being able to say no, uh, being able to to put on the, on the back burner stuff, to really focus on what's going to move the needle. And when you have a team and you can do that together, yeah. Like I'd be interested to know how you do that as a team, as a leader. Like how do you get your team focused on just the big rocks? Yeah. Because you can tell so, them so that doesn't mean they will. <laughs> no, no, no. And and uh, and I think um the level of clarity that I can have at my level is uh is uh, not necessarily cascaded down um to my team. I need to be again super intentional in the way I communicate and and communicating over and over and over and over about what we want to achieve and why it is important and uh, and uh, and being able to uh, to apply ruthless uh, prioritization it's tough it's super tough and uh, i and and sometimes i have the impression i i keep repeating myself and uh, so i stop repeating and and actually no you you need uh, that's that's the thing i, I i'm learning with uh with with the experience is uh you need to be a broken recall. I I went to a, a conference recently and one of the people at the at the at the conference said that in their role they needed to be the chief repetition officer. <laughs> Just keep repeating. That's good. That's very good. Yeah. And so I think I have a strong bias on my side. I think uh, I I have a very good memory, and 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 uh, and that deserve that's uh, that's uh, a curse in yeah. work sometimes because um, I expect others to or bias because I expect people to have uh, you know the same level of uh, memory that I have, and uh, you, you tell me something once and usually I get it and I, I will remember for a long time, and uh, and um, but uh, but around me that's not the case and uh, and 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 that's the bias I, I need to um, 
to to fix on in my head is uh, really say nope uh, I need to keep repeating I need to to get back we, to it we all and, and also we to, to yeah yeah we all do that like we I'm a list maker I love to make lists I love to be very organized and and uh, one of the hardest things that I that I ever did was I decided to hire somebody as my director of channel ops and she'll, if she listens to this, she'll know who she is. She, she gets things done. She is fantastic at getting things done, but she is not a list maker in the same way that I am. And, you know, I'm very, like I told you, data driven, list driven, right? I, I think that way. I'm kind of a structured thinker and she is more of an unstructured thinker. But she's super inspirational and she gets things done and she makes things fun. And she's, you know, kind of the spark of light who is wonderful to have on any team. And I really had to be, you know, I love to hire people who think just like me. And I had to say, no, my team needs her. Like we need somebody different. We need somebody that doesn't have the same skill set that's going to bring some more light to our team, some more fun some you know but still have that same energy of getting things done um and no regrets like you know but i did have to check myself like okay she's getting things done like maybe not in the exact way that you would get them done right (laughs) because she has a different skill set you know she has something that you know that i work on and so i can learn from her Going back to be intentional. Yeah. 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 And not hiring people who (laughs) think, you know, it's not just hiring about hiring people that just look like you, which is always the default. I mean, by the way, default for me too, my unconscious bias, my last team was predominantly women, right? Because, you know, you hire people who look like you. Um, I also tend to hire people who think like me. So I have to start to be more intentional about, you know, and I was, you know, I, you know, had started, you know, to recruit people who didn't look like me, who didn't think like me. Um, I think that makes for more powerful organizations. Yes. But it's yeah. hard. It yeah. is hard and it's not comfortable. No, but uh, I can say that uh, having gone through this exercise, uh, it's really powerful. It's, uh, it's, it's uncomfortable for sure. Yeah. And, uh, rewarding. Yeah. So uh, I agree. I so, agree. Yeah. Yeah. It's a journey. It's a journey, and um, and again, as Daryl would say, uh, w- w- would say, um, we are all leaders in in construction. We're all learning all the time, and uh, and that's the beauty of the role. It's uh, you never stop learning. Oh, you should not. You should never stop. No. learning. And- don't you remember when you were early in your career and you'd be like, oh man, that director, they just know everything and everybody would vent about them because you know, of course they're not perfect because they're just a person who's nope. learning and, you know, developing same as, you know, you, you know, once you realize your parents weren't perfect when you were a teenager, right? You can start <laughs> complaining about them until you get to be a little older and then you appreciate them. But, you know. That's all we are. We're all like, sure. th- and that also, yeah, I used to be so intimidated by executives. I, you know, I really like was um, like, like freeze up and, and um, was so intimidated. And until I, I, my husband has a really good friend who got you know promoted into a very important position. And um, I was like, wait a second. Like, you know, I did beer bongs with this guy and like, he's an idiot. Like, and I love him. Like he's not an idiot, but you know, once I realized that like, he's just a person, right. He's a person that I like and he's an executive now. So, you know, something about that would like kind of took the, yeah, that aura, that intimidating aura away of all executives. I don't know how it happened, but like, then I was like, Oh, they're all just people like that. Something's keeping everyone on the wake at night. They all have worries and insecurities and everybody has imposter syndrome at some point. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, actually, there was a, a good point that um, Alison brought uh, in, in our episode. Yeah. Alison, uh, about you, you remember? Um, because I asked her, okay, how do you, how do you, uh, because I, I could see her being super effective at uh, managing up and uh, influencing executives. Uh, in our previous company. Yeah, I think she was really good at that. 
And uh, and she told me, I mean, uh, you just need to remind yourself that they are just human and they have concerns. And your job is to try to understand uh, their concern and map what you are trying to do with uh, their concern and how you are, are. Are you able to help them? And if that's the case, then it's easy. You yeah. you, you will be able to uh, to demonstrate that uh, you are bringing value to their business and so on. So I said, yeah, that's so yeah. simple. And actually. I'm proud of myself. I, it's a proud moment. It's a pride day, actually, to because um, I had I had a, a six, successful meeting with uh, senior leadership today, and uh, and I, I applied this. I mean, um, we had a meeting back in July. They they shared some concerns and uh, some of the challenges they're facing, and we came back today, um, not with our agenda that we were we were pushing, but with. Um, a doc that explained how we are going to address those some of their concerns, ah. and uh, and that was, I mean, and aligned with our mission. It's not just uh, oh yeah. yeah, we are going to help them because we are the, the VPs, right? That's a good uh, feeling. But, uh, That's but, such uh, a good feeling. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and at the end of the meeting, they, they thank us. Said yeah, that was a great doc. It's exactly aligned. We feel confident. Let's move forward. Blah blah blah. Say wow, yeah, we made it. And 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 actually. What it took in 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 um you know in insight is that uh, it was uh, that curiosity about um, you know asking the question about okay what are some of the changes um, and and then think how our team can contribute to those changes and and try to solve them. And uh, I think curiosity is moment. definitely one of the s- most important things that leaders can do and as you're developing into a leader um, is having that curiosity and just like I've gotten very comfortable being in a room where I ask a question that I'm pretty sure might be the dumbest question and I can't tell you how many times somebody has said I'm so glad you asked that because I didn't know what like what they were talking about either you know what was that acronym what does that stand for you know yeah, I, I can play them as well. Yeah. I, I do that very well. <laughs> You're a natural. You're a natural. We're both naturals at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't mind. I don't mind asking those questions because because generally, often uh, I'm not sure I, I got it right. So uh, I, I want to make sure that I am on the same page. And and also I am. Um, I'm not a, a native speaker, so I play that card and say, "Hey, what do you mean?" Oh, do you yeah. Like so, uh, so that's just, uh, <laughs> easier. <laughs> I'm going to turn right. you in. I'm going to uh, turn you in. You're playing the name, you know, the non-native speaker. I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> just to be sure, what what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Yeah, hopefully my my boss is not going to listen to the show. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm, <laughs> I'm 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 always joking with him, and he's not native either. Uh, so, so that's fine. That's good. The um, I, I think uh, what we just talked about is a, is a good um, also a good um, reference back to what you said about thinking big. What uh, Greg told you earlier, you know, uh, thinking big by looking around and looking at uh, what the challenges of uh, the business uh, are facing, not just. Y- the changes that you are facing in the execution, but uh, what the company are is facing, and what your 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 VPs are are facing, and uh, and that's how uh, you you get that uh, not necessarily executive presence, but uh, that um, uh, are you going you are in trust from leadership? Yeah, yeah, I think that that you know really what you said, you know, you're aligning to what they care about, um, but the only way you know what they care about is if you ask. And yes. so, and, you know, sometimes it feels like a dumb question to ask, you know, what's our strategy? What's, what's the end goal for, you know, other than growth, right? It's always growth, more money. Yeah. But, you know, really like what's the strategy to get there? What, you know, what do you think it is? How do I contribute to that? Um, you know, what, what's your perspective on that? I think it's, you know, some of the most important conversations you can, probably the most important conversations you can have with your leadership. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I I agree with you. Uh, the um, I think um, that that may also uncover the lack of strategy sometimes, and then it's an opportunity for someone to, I mean, you 
to help leaders to say, hey, we need to come up with a, a good strategy. Uh, I mean, we are operating like this and it's a, in a tactical way. Uh, what, where, where do we want to be in, in one year or three years from now? Yeah. And those are really hard, hard questions, to be honest. They're very hard questions. And then to narrow that down, like as a company, you can kind of figure out where you want to be, but to figure out how you're going to get there in the different moving parts, I mean, it takes all the brains together to try and figure that yes. out. Yes. And so, you know, yeah. if, you can, if you can really figure out how you can contribute to that big goal, which is hard, I and mean, I don't, it's not always the easiest thing. So you might have one yeah. idea and then another idea or three ideas, you know, see what gets shot down. And not, yes. and not get and, your feelings hurt. Not get your feelings hurt. No, no, so that's a big one. But also, um, as a leader, um, you need to provide clarity to your teams. And uh, I think that's something I, I failed on this year for a good part of the year. They're uh, all listening. Come time. on, they're all listening right now. I, I don't mind. No, it's <laughs> being, you know, that's my vulnerability moment. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I mean, uh, it has been a difficult um, journey to to clearly identify our priorities. There are a bunch of things, a lot of things that we were doing. Great stuff, by the way. The hardest thing was to trim everything down to five things. Yeah. So we could get everyone aligned because otherwise we had, we, we had always, always, always conflicting priorities. Oh, I'm doing this or I'm doing that. And uh, and, I'm, I'm, and yes, it's important for the business. So, so let's, okay, let's do it. Let's do it. I know. But every, I mean, uh, so, so, um, so, um, so it, it took, took me a while and with my peers to um to come down to five things that we want to focus on until the end of the year and in and in twenty twenty four as well. We would do only those five things. Yeah. It's good. And uh it's tough. It's, it's tough. But uh yeah it, I feel good about the it. The best companies right when I worked for EMC, um one thing I remember really clearly is that they were so good about kind of setting the top level priorities and then everybody had to align to those priorities. Um, and so like you knew what work you were doing, how it was aligned to those top level. And everybody was sort of like, it's like, you know, everybody's beaten to the same beat of the drum. And so it's louder and more successful and, and it's more fun too. Right. There's, you, yeah. you have that clarity. Um, the other thing I was going to say related to um, clarity. Uh, Brene Brown, who is one of my you know favorite speakers, uh, and I'm probably paraphrasing her because I don't remember exactly, but what I took away was clarity is kindness. And so you, your team, if they are my team, if they don't have clarity on the priorities, they are chasing after 10 things, each of them, right? And they are stressed and they are not doing their best work. And so they don't feel successful and they don't, you know, you know, they may be chasing this shiny object, that shiny object, right? They may be getting calls from all over the place to do things. Um, and they're not as happy. And if you can help provide the clarity, right, on, you know, what they, what they need to focus on and make sure that's maintained, their lives are easier and more fun and more productive. And they feel like they're contributing to something bigger, which is, like, yeah. it's great to be on a team like that. So I think it's, I mean, and by the way, I've failed in the clarity thing too. So, um, you know, it's good when you know it's something you need to work on and that you know you have to, like, maybe your new job is chief clarity officer. Um, yeah. Where you are, you just having to repeat yourself. And don't just repeat yourself because you have to rephrase yourself because you might say, might say something in one way that, you know, maybe somebody didn't quite get it. If you rephrase it a completely different way, but the same meaning, oh, maybe, you know, that person who wasn't quite getting it now gets it. Now they're aligned. Um, Agree. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm putting same, it on your business same, card, uh, Chief Clarity Officer. <laughs> <laughs> I do that. <laughs> I'm sure Amazon Leadership won't mind me giving you that title. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, of course. They won't. <laughs> All right, so uh, th there was this topic we wanted to discuss: uh, layoffs. Yeah, um, I think uh, 
the past uh, 40 months, 80 months, uh, specifically in tech, uh, I've been tough for a lot of yeah. people. Uh, people, including you, have, have gone through uh, layoffs. So yeah. uh, um, I'd love to get your insights uh, into into that experience and uh, how you are going through it and um, some lesson learned and uh, and um, yeah I mean to navigate. you know I don't know how many layoffs like a million layoffs in tech in the past year or something so it's nice not to be alone but at the same time I'm in the job market with you know all these other people um, which is good There's, it's not lonely <laughs> right <laughs> circling back around it's not lonely but it, I will tell you it hurts And it hurts for everyone who gets laid off. Um, it hurt me. I, you know, I've been at Riverbed for seven years. And I know it was just a business decision. And it was handled super respectfully. I have all the respect in the world for the company, for my manager, you know, for the leadership um, there. So I, you know, it was hard. Um, I'm very lucky that, number one, they did take good care of me. Number two, um, you know, I'm in a marriage where my husband also has a, a good job. And so we, you know, don't have to worry too much about money. I have so much empathy for, you know, these posts that I see on LinkedIn from people who are like, I'm down to my last unemployment check. You know, I really need a job. And they, you know, are obviously, you know, skilled people um, who were laid off because their companies didn't plan appropriately. Um, the reason that layoffs occur is not because of the individuals, you know, it's because a company didn't plan correctly, hire correctly, right? They made a bad decision. Um, yes. You know, they made a bad call. And so it's hard. I, by the way, I lay in bed at night and go, it wasn't my fault. It wasn't my fault, you know, um, because everybody does that. Everybody does that. And, you know, everybody tries to put, you know, the sun, you know, the sunny posts on LinkedIn, uh, which I did too. And, you know, you hesitate to put open to work on your profile because it might make you look desperate. And But then how are people going to know that you're looking, you know, but there's, yeah. you know, you just feel like you're kind of walking this, um, you know, tight, you know, tightrope, you know, trying to, do the right thing, say the right thing. Um, I was so lucky because the good news is um, I'm very optimistic in, in life in general. You know, my email starts with Meg be happy, which sometimes I'm a little embarrassed to like apply for a job with that, but that is who I am. Um, so, okay. Um, you know, I guess if they want to hire me, you know, they should know that about me. I'm an optimistic, yeah. happy person. Um, and You know, Introvert. so I got laid off. And at the same time, my husband and I have been thinking about um, downsizing. So we wanted to move into like a ranch style house that we could live in until we're in our 80s. And we came across one and we had lived in our old house for 20 years. And there is absolutely no way we could have like packed up, downsized all of our stuff, you know, because we had 20 years of accumulation into a smaller perfect house for us and if I had a job there's just no way so I and I got to take the summer off and go hiking and um, have a really nice time now I'm really hitting the market um, so any of your listeners who know of you know VP of channel sales or marketing roles you know senior director roles in the channel I am open to work and um, I'm excited for the next opportunity and I'm talking to you know, several other, uh, several companies. And um, it's kind of fun and exciting and, uh, you know, but scary. Like uh, I like a, yeah. a singer, his name is Jason Isbell. And um, he sings this song that is, I can't sing. So it's, but the lyrics are be afraid, be very afraid, but do it anyway. And okay. I feel that way every day when I go, I'm like, okay, we're going to apply for that job. We're going to have that interview. We're going to, You know, reach out to that person that I don't know very well, but they know somebody. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna, you know, go outside of my natural introvert nature, and yes. I think that's something you know you have to do. So I'm, you know, I'm doing it, but it's, you know, it was not easy. Um, you know, I do make friends at work, and I, you know, I probably have said we're all family. I will never say that again. Um, by the way. Um, 
because you're not, because they might let you off. And I always knew that, right? I, you know, writing was a little bit on the wall. So, um, but yeah, for everybody else who's out there, you know, looking, number one, feel free to link in to me. Um, let me know they heard me. You know, my network is yours. I, I think we, I, I have been so lucky and so, you know, I have had this week probably five or six people in my network, some of them that I've only met a couple times, reach out and say, oh, I saw this job. Mm -hmm. Did you see it? I know someone at this company, you know, do you want an introduction? Like, so if you can, you know, not, not just you, Roman, but your listeners, if you can do that for other people, mm -hmm. it makes a world of difference, even if they don't get that job. But just to know that you thought of them and you tried to help them, it is, that's the pay it forward. I will do that. I've always done some of that for people. I will do so much better, like moving forward, because yeah. people have been so good to me. Cool. I'm glad to to hear about that. So, uh, yeah, I if it, when I hear about anything, I will let you know. And uh, and of course, I encourage everyone to connect with you on LinkedIn. Yeah. I will, I will uh, give you details on the on the on the, the description of the show for sure. So uh, that's cool, and hopefully you will find uh, you will land in a great place where you can uh, shine. I'm sure you will. That's what I I want to land some place where I can be me, right? Um, yeah. And you know, I get up in the morning and I go, "You are the person the universe needs right now." It's a little cheesy, but it helps me. <laughs> I should put it on like a sign <laughs> in my office. You know? <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mike. So we are heading towards the, the end of the episode. So uh, I will uh, conclude with my usual questions. So how do you keep learning and growing as a leader? I am an extremely curious, motivated learner. So I, you know, go, somebody posts something and I say, oh, here's the best class to take if you want to learn about AI. I go out and take that class. You know, okay. I, I'm starting to interview at security companies and, you know, Riverbend wasn't a security company, neither was EMC. So I'm like, okay, how do I learn everything I need to know about security? Um, I just dig in and start learning it. Um, and by the way, I think that um, you have to kind of check the accuracy of things, but I think that like chat GPT and Bard and uh, some of the AI tools are actually good ways to learn about things. Um, you do have to check the accuracy yes. though. So I think that that's, it could, tell you stupid things, but it's a good way if you just have a general question, tell me more about this. And then you read it and then you go say, is this true? Is this true? Um, it helps you process, like process it. So I, and I ask people all the time, like, how, how do you, what do you need to learn next? What's, you know, I think I will be a lifelong learner. I'd love to, love to learn about everything, not just work things. Yeah. So uh, cool. So thank you. So how do you learn? I mean, um, I mean, are you, are you taking courses? Are you reading books? Are you uh, attending conferences? What's the, what's the old so, usual? Yeah, for work, I do attend conferences and I love that because I learn more than sometimes the content at the conference. I learn from the other people at the conference, yeah. having those conversations of how are you solving this problem? What do you think about this happening in the industry? Um, I love to do things like that. Um, but I do take, like, I don't like sign up for paid courses very frequently. Um, but I do, you know, I'll do the online courses. I've done LinkedIn learning courses um, and just like online kind of YouTube content. Like MIT has a big one um, on yeah. AI and I you know, watch that. And, um, my dad likes to, you know, he's, he's got a bit of dementia, but he's, he still is like very smart. And so he likes to do the great courses. Um, and mm -hmm. so sometimes I'll sit with him and, you know, like learn about, you know, things about World War II I never, ever thought I would be interested in. But then it's super interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good. So do you have a book to recommend? or something? I'm in the middle of a book. I'm in the middle of a book. Ah. And I, of course, forgot to write down the author's name, but it is called Multipliers. And it has a wealth of advice about how to become somebody as a leader who kind of the goodness is multiplied. So people are like happy and satisfied and doing more work than you ever thought possible because they're leading their own kind of destiny. And so I am really, I, I don't usually enjoy business books. 
to be honest. But I'm really enjoying that one because I, I could see putting this advice into action. Cool. All right. And last question before I let you go. What other, other leaders should I interview next? What, what would you recommend? And who could you introduce me to? Well, I think you should interview my executive coach, Greg Giuliano, because okay. he, would, he has so many good ideas for people. He works with executives across industries. So I think he would be a really good one. And then let me think on it because there's probably some other people. I have a friend too. I have to ask her. But she is uh, just recently in a big new role. Uh, she's in the aggregates industry, like like gravel for roads and things. So, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. But company of like 5,000 people and 4,000 of them report to her. So she would be interested in it. So let me. Wow. I, yeah. I don't want to give out her name without. Yeah. yeah. Checking. Okay. First. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Sounds great. Sounds good. Thank, thanks for your time. I yeah, really enjoyed it, Ramon. And I hope Likewise. that, you know, something I said sparked some interest or something with someone. Because really, I believe in this, you know, pay it forward and, um, you know, always happy to do so with you. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Have a good Take weekend. Yes. Bye. <laughs> and you. Bye-bye. You stayed until the end. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Paid Forward Society. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and share it with at least two people who would benefit from this discussion. Your support helps me reach more people and make a greater impact. You can also help me get discovered by leaving a five-star rating and a review on your favorite podcast platform. I appreciate your support and look forward to continuing this journey with you. Bye.